Hello and welcome to Moments in History. I'm Linda Shenton Matchett, author, speaker, and history geek. While researching my stories, I unearthed tons of intriguing historical information that doesn't end up in my books. So I've created this channel to share these tidbits with you. I really appreciate you stopping by to watch. Famed aviator Charles Lindbergh became increasingly unsettled by the public attention surrounding him and his family in the wake of the kidnapping of his son and the Hauptmann trial. In December of 1935, he and Anne moved the family to Europe where they hoped to live more private lives. For nearly four years, they lived in England and France, making only one brief holiday visit to the United States in December of 1937. In 1936, at the request of officials at the American Embassy in Berlin, Lindbergh was invited to Germany to help gather intelligence about the Reich's growing military air power. With the admiring approval of German Air Minister Hermann Goering, Lindbergh toured combat units, factories, airports, military bases, including some that had never been seen by an American. After his tours, Lindbergh concluded that Germany was, quote, now able to produce military aircraft faster than any European country, possibly even faster than we could in the States. A person would have to be blind not to realize that they have already built up tremendous strength, unquote. Over the next two years, Lindbergh made several more visits to German factories and airfields. On October 18, 1938, he then attended a dinner in Berlin with several distinguished guests. That evening, Goering presented Lindbergh with the service cross of the German Eagle for his service to world aviation. The medal had previously been presented to other foreign dignitaries visiting Germany, including fellow Americans Henry Ford and IBM chairman Thomas Watson. But several sources indicate the award to Lindbergh came as a su surprise to everyone at the event. Many saw Lindbergh's acceptance of the Nazi medal as a sign of Lindbergh's sympathies with the Third Reich, and he was lambasted in the American press. However, he did remain popular with the public. The Lindberghs had been preparing to purchase a home in the Berlin sub suburb of Wannsee when they learned about the event that would become known later as Kristallnacht, or Night of Broken Glass. Convinced that Germany would win any coming war based on its superior military strength, the Lindberghs decided that the safest place for the family was back in the United States. On, in April of 1939, they returned to New York. Upon his return, Lindbergh became a vocal advocate for American neutrality. He felt that whatever happened in Europe did not affect the U.S., nor was it the American people's problem. He also felt that Germany's power alone would prevent what he called Asiatic hordes from taking over Europe. In a Reader's Digest essay published in November of 1938, he warned against a war within our own family of nations, a war which will reduce the strength and destroy the treasures of the white race. Ouch. Fortunately, he was not the only one to hold these views, but he was more vocal than many, making public statements and speaking appearances where he advocated for American isolationism. The idea began to take hold, and the America First Committee was founded at Yale University by student R. Douglas Stewart, Jr., and headed by retired U.S. Army General Robert E. Wood, who at that time was chairman of Sears, Roebuck & Company. The group grew and included people from all walks of life. Primarily supporting isolationism for its own sake, the organization argued that no foreign power could successfully attack a strongly defended America and that a British defeat by Germany wouldn't create danger for U.S. national security. They insisted that giving aid to Britain would risk pulling the U.S. into the war. AFC was strongly opposed to the measures put forward by President Roosevelt, such as the Lend-Lease Bill and Destroyers for Bases deal. Their four basic principles were the United States must build an impregnable defense for America, no foreign power, nor group of powers can successfully attack or prepared America. American democracy can only be preserved by keeping out of the European war. An aid short of war weakens national defense at home and threatens to involve America in a war abroad. 
Eventually, the organization would surpass 800,000 members in 450 chapters at its peak. There were many high-profile people involved in AFC, such as Henry Ford, but Ford's strong anti-Semitic views created problems within and around the organization, and he eventually resigned in controversy. About this time, Lindbergh joined the organization and became its most prominent spokesperson. Interestingly, at this same time, Lindbergh was also acting as a high-level advisor to the U.S. Army Air Corps, and he carried pers on personal correspondence with the commanding general, Henry Hap Arnold, the general who would later support the creation of the Women's Air Service pilots. Lindbergh's argument for increasing U.S. defense capability found a supportive audience among the military planners, but his strategic vision was hindered by his belief that aviation was a uniquely Western innovation, again using discriminatory comments that insisted aviation was, quote, one of those priceless possessions which permit the white race to live in a pressing sea of yellow, black, and brown, unquote. He would later declare that, no nation in Asia has developed their aviation sufficiently to be a serious menace to the United States at this time. Needless to say, he would have to eat those words a little more than a year later after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Through 1941, he traveled coast to coast, speaking to crowds of thousands. At one point, Roosevelt's Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, challenged Lindbergh to denounce Nazi Germany. Having poured himself into the anti-war movement, he declined. Even Robert Wood encouraged Lindbergh to address the pro-Nazi ac accusations, but instead he went on the attack. On September 11, 1941, Lindbergh was at an America First event in Des Moines, Iowa, where he labeled the British, the Jewish, and the Roosevelt administration as war agitators, who had used misinformation and propaganda to mislead and frighten the American public. Saying he sympathized with the plight of the Jews in Germany, he stated entry into the war would serve them little better. It's not difficult to understand why Jewish people desired to overthrow Nazi Germany. The persecution they suffered in Germany would be sufficient to make bitter enemies of any race. No person with a sense of the dignity of mankind can condone the persecution of the Jewish race and suffering in Germany. But no person of honesty and vision can look on their pro-war policy here today without seeing the dangers involved in such a policy, both for us and for them. Instead of agitating for war, the Jewish groups in this country should be opposing it in every possible way, for they will be among the first to feel its consequences. Tolerance is a virtue that depends upon peace and strength. History shows that it cannot survive war and devastation. A few far-sighted Jewish people realize this and stand opposed to opposition, but the majority still do not. Their greatest danger to this country lies in their large ownership and influence in our motion pictures, our press, our radio, and our government." End quote. The response was immediate. Even though the public supported measures against Japan, many people favored sending material assistance to Great Britain in its fight against Nazi Germany especially since the fall of France. Support for Lindbergh evaporated and the Des Moines speech was denounced as anti-Semitic and un-American. When the United States entered the war, many of Lindbergh's American first peers joined active duty military. Having publicly resigned his commission during the spat with Roosevelt, however, Lindbergh had effectively closed that door on the possibility. He appealed to General Arnold, but few in the War Department were willing to support someone whose loyalty to the U.S. appeared to be in question. Officials in the Roosevelt administration saw no military or political benefit in reinstating an officer who had spent almost two years vilifying them. Denied a role in the military, Lindbergh threw himself into the war effort as a civilian, serving as a consultant to the Ford Motor Company and to the United Aircraft Corporation. In April of 1944, he was sent to the Pacific Theater supposedly to investigate performance issues with UAC's F-4U Corsair. And although he wore the uniform of a U.S. Navy officer, he lacked any rank or command authority, and as a civilian, he was officially barred from firing weapons in combat. However, by the time he reached the front lines in New Guinea, those mandates were largely ignored. 
as a quote-unquote technician and later as an observer, Lindbergh flew 50 combat missions, most of them in the cockpit of a P-38 Lightning, strafing and bombing enemy ground and naval targets. He's in fact credited with shooting down a Japanese Sonya aircraft. However, one of his greatest contributions was his technical expertise, and he developed a novel technique that reduced the P-38's fuel consumption very dramatically, increasing the plane's already impressive operational range. Following the end of the war in Europe, he accompanied a Navy mission that investigated German aviation developments. He consulted with Pan American World Airways and the U.S. Department of Defense for a time before the family moved to Connecticut, where they led quiet lives as both he and his wife wrote and published several books. The Spirit of St. Louis was published in 1953 and won a Pulitzer Prize. Lindbergh was appointed Brigadier General in the Air Force Reserve by President Eisenhower in 1954. The family eventually moved to Hawaii, where Lindbergh passed away in August of 1974. A complex man, indeed. I hope you've enjoyed today's moment in history. If you'd like to learn even more history, please stop by my blog, which can be found on my website at www.lindashentonmatchett.com. And please consider subscribing to my channel, clicking the bell icon to receive notifications of new episodes that release generally on the second and fourth Fridays of each month. You now have the opportunity to partner with me in my author journal through Patreon and receive exclusive benefits not available anywhere else. Depending on your level of support, you'll get to read along as I write, obtain advanced copies of ebooks or signed paperbacks, and attend live monthly chats. You might even get to name a character. Head on over to my page found at patreon.com forward slash Linda Shenton Matchett for more information. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Linda Shenton Matchett. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.